Thank you for joining me today um, for the first of two fantastic public lectures oriented towards undergraduates to be given by our distinguished undergraduate lecturer this year. My name is Elizabeth Schechter. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy and the Cognitive Science program here. Just a reminder that there's going to be, um, as you may have inferred, a reception after today's lecture. Um, what's going to happen is that uh, the talk will last for about an hour. We will pause in case people need to leave, um, and then there will be Q&A for half an hour, and then the reception. Tomorrow there will be um, another talk, same time, same place, called The Virtual and the Real on Virtual Reality. Um, our, uh, oh, and I should mention that both lectures are being made possible by the generous support of John, Julia, and Alice Lindsay, and by the Office of the Bicentennial. Our distinguished undergraduate lecturer this year is David Chalmers, a philosopher at NYU and a university professor of philosophy and neuroscience and the co-director with Ned Block of NYU's Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness. Chalmers is one of those philosophers whose work is of truly interdisciplinary reach. He has published on, and this is only a partial list, um, AI, meaning, computation, mental content, epistemology, decision theory, metaphysics modality, and of course, uh, consciousness, the work for which he's most famous. I think his first love also. Um, and um, that's what he's going to be speaking to us uh, uh, speaking to us about today. Even if you've never read anything of Chalmers on consciousness, you've probably still learned from him. Um, for instance, if you've read about the hard problem of consciousness, a term he coined, or the neural correlates, the search for the neural correlates of consciousness, because his work has received a lot of uptake, um, not just amongst philosophers, but also from um, neuroscientists, psychologists, and other scientists tackling this great frontier. His foundational writings on this topic, um, and he is he has identified several of the core problems in consciousness studies. What's most special about today's lecture is that while Chalmers apparently began talking uh, and thinking about consciousness even as an undergraduate, his writing on consciousness uh, began right here at Indiana University um, Bloomington where he earned a dual PhD in philosophy and cognitive science. This was actually after dropping the PhD in mathematics that he'd been pursuing at Oxford University. And he writes of this decision in the acknowledgement to his dissertation titled Towards the Science of Consciousness that he simply came to realize that he was too preoccupied by the science of consciousness to, um, uh, to focus on maths. Um, and that quote, after some correspondence with Doug Hofstadter and a visit to Indiana, I decided that Indiana University, with the double attraction of its new cognitive science program and its fine philosophy department, was the best place for me. His dissertation was co-chaired by Douglas Hofstadter and Mike Dunn. Rob Goldstone was also on the committee. I think all of them are here today. So please join me not just in welcoming Dave Chalmers, but in welcoming him back. Thanks so much, Liz. It's uh, such a pleasure to be back here in, in Bloomington at IU. It's been, a, it's really hard to believe it's been 30 years, in fact, 31 years since I, uh, since I started here in January of 1989. I think, you know, I'm, I'm not going to come to terms with that, with that, uh, with that length of time because, I mean, some things haven't changed. It's, uh, it's great to see, uh, see Doug Hofstadter, my thesis advisor, sitting right there in the front row. It still makes me feel like a grad student <laughs> all over again. And uh, Mike Dunn, uh, Rob Goldstone, who were really influential for me on my committee. And um, you know, the campus is still beautiful. And well, I gather Bobby Knight was back in Assembly Hall the other night. So, yeah, <laughs> just like I remember it. Um, you know, my time in, uh, in Bloomington is like kind of incredible to me. In, uh, in retrospect, um, when I was at IU, I just, in that like, five-year period, I learned so much. I mean, I think there's probably no, it feels to me as if there's no other five-year period of my life where I learned, uh, where I learned uh, that much. I mean, I guess zero through five is <laughs> supposed, to be, uh, supposed to be okay. It's a, cri a critical period for learning different things. Well, I feel like the five years at IU were just another critical period for me, I, I learned philosophy. I didn't know any philosophy coming in. I learned. I didn't know any cognitive science coming in. I learned. Um, I learned cognitive science from the discussions in the in the lab with Doug and the other uh, grad students there. I learned, you know, so much about thinking about the mind from talking with fellow students, from taking classes in 
philosophy and cognitive science, from reading, from thinking. Pretty much everything I've done since then was based on stuff I learned in those, uh, in those uh, five years at IU. I wish I could have another. Maybe, maybe it's time for a third critical period. I think I can get one at age 53. I don't know. But um, anyway, I know a lot of you who are here, at, you know, you don't recognize these things necessarily at the time. I'm not sure I recognized it at the time. So some of you are here studying it at IU, I hope that, you know, I hope that you're managing to have a, think of this as a, as a critical period of your own where you're just soaking up um, so much that's on offer in this uh, amazing program at this amazing, um, in the amazing programs at this amazing university. So it's just a real, a real pleasure to be back. And the themes I'll be talking about today in some ways build on things I was thinking about working on my PhD uh, here. Um, you know, the pro I'm some of the themes around the problem of consciousness remain the same, but here I'll be approaching it from the meta perspective. And of course, you know, the master of, uh, of meta is here in the, uh, in the front row. I think the, the, the concept of meta is associated with Doug Hofstadter more than, uh, more than with anybody else. And so the, uh, the, um, the approach of going meta is something I really learned uh, from Doug about many, many problems about many, many questions and, and issues. There's actually this wonderful uh, quotation out there. Anything you can do, I can do meta. I like this. It's often attributed to Doug. I mean, that didn't ring true to me when I saw this attributed to Doug. It doesn't sound like the kind of thing Doug would actually say. It's kind of showy and, and in, a way, in a way that, uh, that Doug uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't say. But I, nonetheless, I found that... Uh, Dan Dennett attributes this to, uh, to Doug. Uh, I like Douglas Hofstadter's wonderful maxim quoted by Dennett, anything you can do, I can do meta. I gather Doug attributes this to, to Dan Dennett, but Dennett <laughs> denies it. This is one of those strange loops, if you know what I mean. But I had to, I had to dig a bit further on this, actually. If you dig further on, on the web, there's an even more interesting attribution, attributing it to <laughs> Rudolf Kahner. <laughs> Any of you who know anything about Carnap will know that this is far more implausible than attributing it to Doug Hofstadter. He would never say anything so, uh, so, uh, so frivolous. Nonetheless, it's out there on the web. I even found this. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, that's Immanuel Kant. And uh, Alan, did Kant say this? No. Okay. Okay, so um, it's not, yeah. So this is attributed to uh, everybody under the sun. I, from my digging, the most reliable attribution I could actually find was a discussion on language blog, the blog where they found it mentioned in an article in December 79 by a law professor at Yale, Arthur Allen Leff, who attributes it to his colleague, also in the Yale Law School, Leon Lipson, around 1979. So as far as I can tell, that's the earliest attribution um, of this, but maybe we can go, uh, we can go earlier. Anyway, I like this idea of you know going meta, jumping up a level. That's certainly something I learned from Doug. And today I'm going to be applying that perspective to the problem of consciousness. I mean, I'll start with just a statement of what I call the meta problem of consciousness, and I'll explain why it's um, its relation to to you know other non-meta problems. So the meta problem of consciousness is explained why we think there's a problem of consciousness. Why meta problem? When I was here at IU, I remember someone gave a talk on meta something, and they said that meta x is always x about x. Do you remember this one? Like, yeah, metacognition, cognition about cognition, meta theory, a theory about a theory. It's like, yeah, that sometimes works. Meta ethics is not ethics about ethics. It's just jumping up a level. But uh, the meta problem is definitely, it's a problem about a problem. And the problem it's about is the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, the hard problem of consciousness is explaining why and how physical processes give rise to conscious experience, how it is that processes in the brain and maybe elsewhere give rise to the subjective experience of the mind and the world. I was looking around on the web for illustrations of the hard problem, and I found, uh, I found this one on there. I quite like it because it looks like someone's hair is catching fire. But um, yeah, somehow, how does, the, you know, the, how does the, the matter of the brain give rise to the fire of, of consciousness? More specifically, the, uh, the hard problem is concerned with phenomenal consciousness. 
it's a philosopher's term for what it's like to be a conscious subject from the first person point of view. This, uh, this locution was made famous in an article by Thomas Nagel, my colleague at NYU, who back in 1974 wrote an article called What is it like to be a bat? And the thought is, well, we don't know what it's like to be a bat, but it's like something to be a bat, using its sonar to locate um, objects, and you know, is it like vision, is it like hearing? Well, we don't know, is it like something else again? It's very hard to tell, but it's presumably like something. Um, there's some first person experience of being a bat. That is the bat's phenomenal consciousness. Um, so we say a system is phenomenally conscious if there's something it's like to be it. So if there's something it's like to be me, I presume there's something it's like to be you, something like to be bats and cats, but you know, maybe there's not something it's like to be this lectern. If not, then the lectern is not phenomenally conscious. And same for mental states. A mental state is conscious in this sense, phenomenally conscious, if there's something it's like to be in that state. You know, we do have states of the cognitive system that are not conscious, that don't like bubble up and make a difference to our experience. Maybe a lot of processes, say, in the cerebellum have that status or unconscious processing of linguistic structures. But an awful lot of mental states are phenomenally conscious. So visual experiences, I look out in the audience and have an experience of, you know, colored objects in certain locations in my visual field, um, other sensory experiences, the sound of my voice, taste, bodily sensations like pain and orgasm, all of these have distinctive first person qualities of subjective experience. Mental imagery, I can think about you know, how Bloomington looked when I was here 30 years ago, maybe that'll be associated with some emotional experiences happiness and anger, and indeed a stream of a current thought as I'm reflecting about this, deciding what to do next, and so on. All of these are part of the stream of consciousness as experienced from the first person point of view. And the hard problem is basically explaining that kind of subjective experience in terms of physical processes in the, uh, in the brain. Now, this contrasts with the so-called easy problems of consciousness, which are not easy in any sense, in the sense that they're trivial, um, you know, that they may well take decades or centuries to get to the, uh, to get to the bottom of, but they're easy in the sense that we have a paradigm for explaining them. And the easy problems of consciousness are roughly the problems of, a, of explaining certain behaviors or behavioral cognitive functions associated with consciousness. How do we discriminate information, discriminate things, in the environment so that we can uh, react to them differentially? How do we integrate information from different sources, say from, a, from vision and from audition? How do we bring those things to bear in our control of behavior so I can, say, point at certain people? And indeed, how can we produce verbal reports about goings on in the environment and our mental states? All of these are often associated with, uh, with consciousness, but uh, there's a sense that none of them are the central the central mystery in part because we have a paradigm for explaining those things. It's the paradigm of functional explanation. We explain or address the easy problems by finding a neural or computational mechanism that performs the relevant function, say that's responsible for our verbal reports or our pointing or our integration or our discrimination. Very, very non-trivial task. But we have a sense of what we need to do and gradually through the progress of neuroscience, cognitive science, it uh, looks like we have a path to finding those mechanisms. For phenomenal consciousness, on the other hand, there seems to be a kind of explanatory gap that's not present in the other cases. For the hard problem, it looks like when you explain these behavioral functions, you know, what, how is it the discrimination or the integration or the control or the report happens, it leaves open a further question. Why is all that accompanied by conscious experience? Why doesn't all this processing go on in the dark, as it were, without, without consciousness? And to many people, including me, there seems to be an explanatory gap between uh, physical processes and subjective experience because that standard paradigm of explaining things by explaining associated functions 
doesn't seem to get a grip. So here's somebody, here's someone's depiction of the explanatory gap. Again, how does a, there's some kind of magic synthesis that seems to take place between the brain and consciousness that we have to figure out. Now there are many, many, this is all on the first order problem of consciousness, not the meta problem. There are many, many approaches to the hard problem, just to the first order hard problem of consciousness. We can divide them into roughly two classes, some of which take consciousness as irreducible, say to processes, to physical processes, and some of which take it as reducible. So on the side of irreducibility, you've got views like dualism, where consciousness is non-physical, separate from the brain, but interacting with it. You've got views like panpsychism, that says consciousness is everywhere, even in uh, very, very simple systems, maybe even in, say, elementary particles, and the whole world is somehow, or at least our consciousness is somehow made up of or constituted by consciousness at that level. That's a view which recently has been getting a lot of play. There are even more extreme views like idealism. Um, the physical world as a whole is somehow wholly mental, and minds at the bottom level make up the entire physical world. These are all views which are interesting and which I've explored in some other work. My sympathies tend to be on this side, although the views also have a lot of problems to be dealt with. Um, but on the other side of the coin, there's views on which consciousness is reducible to, say, physical or maybe computational processes in line with the fairly standard approach of cognitive science of trying to explain everything in terms of neural computational processes. There are views like functionalism, which very broadly speaking might try to explain term consciousness in terms of associated computational processes. Biological materialism, which try and tries and explains it in terms of specific biology, and even quantum mechanical materialism that tries to get it all from quantum mechanics. My own view is that each of these leaves open an explanatory gap, um, but nonetheless I think they're all worth pursuing. Anyway, but that's just all the boring first order hard problem of consciousness that's, uh, that's pretty familiar. My approach today is not going to be to look at one versus two here, but to postulate to take approach three, which, uh, which relies on a principle I learned from, uh, from my advisor, Doug, which is to, you know, sometimes you need to jump out of the system, or jutes, as, a, as Doug put it, J-O-O-T-S, jump out of the system. Instead of trying to address this problem directly, go meta about the problem. And you can go meta in different, uh, in different directions. But here, I'm going to go meta by asking the question, why do we think consciousness poses a problem? Why do we say consciousness poses a problem? And one way to kind of to approach this issue, which is the, the meta problem, is to think about one behavioral, one bit of behavior that is very closely related to the hard problem of consciousness. And this is the bit of behavior that we make phenomenal reports or verbal reports of conscious experiences. We talk about our consciousness. I've been standing up here for the last 10 minutes or so talking about my consciousness and the problems it poses. That's a bit of behavior. That's something that uh, ought to be explainable by the methods that explain behavior, including you know, neuroscience, computational, cognitive science, and so on. So I say things like, I'm conscious, I'm feeling pain now. In principle, those are bits of behavior. Those seem to, in principle, fall with the easy problems. We ought to have a paradigm for explaining them. As bits of behavior, they ought to, in principle, be explicable by neural computational mechanisms. The same goes to focus, we can focus down more specifically from, our, from phenomenal reports to what we can call problem reports. Reports expressing our sense or that consciousness poses a hard problem. So here are some things that, say, at least someone like me might say, there's a hard problem of consciousness. Explaining behavior doesn't explain consciousness. Consciousness seems non-physical. And intuitions like these, although not universally shared, or uh, I think fairly widely shared, they can be found in many, many people. Well, again, that's a bit of behavior about us. Again, open to functional explanation. So the meta problem of consciousness is roughly the problem of explaining these problem reports. In principle, again, that's a puzzle about behavior, so it falls officially with the easy problems ought to be open to standard functional explanation in terms of reductionist mechanisms. But at the same time, 
the meta problem is closely tied to the hard problem. On the one hand, it's an easy problem. It's more tractable than the hard problem. It looks like, you know, there's a, in principle a straightforward empirical research program here of explaining those reports. At the same time, it seems so obviously so close to the hard problem that solving it ought to shed light on the hard problem of consciousness. There's a number of different ways in which you might take it to shed light on the hard problem, and I'll explain, I'll look at some of those towards the end of the talk, but, but for now I just want to introduce you to the, uh, to the problem as kind of a useful, somewhat neutral way of making some progress. I mean, you might, in a way, the meta problem can be viewed as what philosophers sometimes call genealogical analysis, which involves you know, explaining certain phenomena via the genealogy of what we think about those things, you know, the historical way those judgments were brought about, shedding light on a domain by analyzing how our judgments about that domain are formed. So you can do that with religion, say. Think about why do, um, take a genealogical approach to religion by thinking why do we make the judgments we do about why do we believe in God and so on. Maybe someone can tell an evolutionary story or a psychological story about why beliefs like that were to be expected because they helped comfort us or provide us with certain motivations that played an evolutionary role. We can also do this for morality. Why do we believe the things we do about what kind of actions are right and wrong? And many people try to tell, say, evolutionary stories about why we make those judgments. That often, not always, but often leads to debunking our beliefs about those domains. If we can explain why we believe in God without postulating God, then some people say, you don't need to take our beliefs in God so seriously. Explain our beliefs in morality without postulating morality. We don't need to take those beliefs so seriously. So many people, my colleague Sharon Street at NYU, for example, has done a lot of work on debunking arguments in that domain. You might well think one role the meta problem might play for you would be to debunk beliefs about consciousness by somehow explaining them without postulating this special thing called consciousness. If you went that way, that would lead you to the philosophical view that's come to be known as illusionism. Illusionism, to a first approximation, it's the view that consciousness is an illusion. We think we're conscious somehow, we judge we're conscious, we say we're conscious, but in fact, consciousness does not exist. This also sometimes gets called strong illusionism. Weak illusionism says consciousness exists, but we make some mistakes about uh, what it involves. At the very least, you might think somehow the sense that consciousness poses a problem could turn out to be an illusion. So explain the illusion and we dissolve the problem. That's a very common thing for illusionists to think. And on that view, roughly, solving the meta problem will dissolve the hard problem. And that's, I think, one view of the relation between the meta problem and the hard problem, the, the illusionist view. And that's become, I mean, that kind of line has been popular for a while, associated with people like Dan Dennett and others, but um, it's become particularly popular recently. Um, Keith Frankish, a British philosopher, has tried to develop illusionism as a theory of consciousness. It's also a view that you can find elements of throughout the history of philosophy and thinking about the mind-body relation or the self and so on. Uh, even Kant, in thinking about, I guess, in the part of the critique of pure reasons or the paralogisms, talks about the transcendental illusion um, of the self, which he uses to explain away at least certain intuitions about the self. In the 20th century, the, the, uh, the Australian philosophers UT Place and David Armstrong in the 50s and 60s tried to diagnose our non-reductionist intuitions about consciousness as coming from something which for Place he called the phenomenological fallacy. Armstrong talked about the headless woman illusion, something I'll get to in a bit. Dan Dennett talked about a user illusion and Keith Frankish, as I mentioned, develops illusionism as a theory of consciousness. So one way you can go with the meta problem is to motivate illusionism. And I'll come back to that particular route towards the end of the talk. But I also think the meta problem is interesting if you're not an illusionist about consciousness. I am not an illusionist about consciousness. I think consciousness is real. I've got, you know, I've got some sympathy with, uh, with illusionism. I think it's an absolutely fascinating view if I was to develop a uh, broadly reductive approach to consciousness, I'd probably go that way. That said, I think that uh, the consciousness is real and not an illusion. 
Um, so I think solving the meta problem does not on its own dissolve the hard problem of consciousness. That said, I think nonetheless the meta problem should be a tractable problem to solve and solving it should shed much light on the hard problem even if it doesn't solve the hard problem. I think it's almost certain that if we can find a good solution to the meta problem why we think about consciousness in these ways, this is almost certain to give us some clues to, for example, the underlying basis of consciousness, um, which ought to provide at the very least interesting constraints on the form of a solution. Okay, so that's the introduction. Now I want to say some things about the general research program of the meta problem before going on to look at, talk a little bit about potential solutions, impact on theories of consciousness, and some upshots for issues about illusionism. So, um, you know, this meta problem opens up, in principle, a tractable empirical research program for everyone reductionists, non reductionists, illusionists, non illusionists. I think we can try to solve it in some relatively neutral way and then think about the philosophical consequences and the upshot for issues like the mind-body problem. So what is the meta problem? Well, one way I, I mean, I wrote, I wrote a long article about this recently and a bunch of people uh, replied and I'm working on now my replies to the replies. In that article, I tried to cast the meta problem more specifically. I won't go into all the details now, um, but the rough idea is to topic neutrally explain what I'll call problem intuitions or to explain why this is impossible. And I'll unpack the different parts of that. One part is what's an intuition here? Well, intuition, as I'll regard it here for current purposes, problem intuitions are dispositions to make problem judgments and problem reports, which are judgments and reports reflecting the, uh, this underlying sense of a problem of consciousness. Philosophers sometimes require intuitions to be non-inferential. If something is formed by reasoning or inference, it's not an intuition. That constraint won't matter here. I'll understand intuitions more broadly. But I do think it's plausible that the most important problem intuitions about consciousness are not formed by reasoning and inference. They're somehow more direct and immediate than that. So what are some of the core problem intuitions? I mean, there's a lot. I divide them into a few classes. There's what we might call metaphysical intuitions, that uh, consciousness is, somehow seems to be you know, intangible, non-physical, explanatory intuitions. Consciousness is hard to explain in terms of physical processes. There seems to be this explanatory gap. There are more specific things. Many of you will know the thought experiment of Mary in the black and white room, who's never seen the color red. She knows all about physical processes from reading about them in black and white textbooks and so on, but she, it seems like there's one central thing she doesn't know, what it's like to see red. And then she leaves the room and she sees red and many people think she gains new knowledge that she could never have gotten from that physical knowledge. Bringing rise to the, giving rise to the sense again of a gap between knowledge of the physical and knowledge of consciousness. There's also um, modal intuitions, intuitions about what's imaginable or conceivable or possible. One of these is the thought experiment of the philosophical zombie. Some of you may be uh, familiar with these. These actually played a central starring role in my PhD dissertation to Doug's horror. Uh, <laughs> Um, there's a wonderful chapter about zombies, by the way, in Doug's book, I Am a Strange Loop, that I recommend to all of you. I don't, uh, I don't agree with everything in there. You won't be surprised to hear, but there's many interesting things to say. Um, a philosophical zombie is someone that uh, is roughly, a, in some ways of understanding it, is a physical, is a functional or behavioral duplicate of a normal human being, but isn't conscious. No one's home. There's no... Uh, no conscious experience, or in the extreme version, it's a physical duplicate of a normal human without consciousness. So imagine me here with all this physical structure and a brain, but no consciousness. I hope you don't actually think that's, uh, that's the way I am, but to many people it at least seems conceivable. Say when you're talking to another person, they might not have consciousness, even once we fill in all the physical facts. So that's one way of 
the very idea that zombies are conceivable, even if not actual, is one way of, get, of getting at uh, intuitions about uh, the gap between physical processes and consciousness, because then there's an explanatory problem. We're not zombies, but why aren't we zombies? Anyway, so many people find zombies conceivable, or if not, they find that the very least, say, a, if there was a computer behaving like us, it would be an open question whether it was conscious. Intuitions like that um, are at least fairly widespread. There are related intuitions, intuitions about the distribution of consciousness, whether robots or groups are conscious, intuitions about the value of consciousness, that it matters morally. For example, I just had a great discussion of this with some of the students about the, you know, the role that consciousness plays, at least in our intuitions, about whether a system matters morally. Roughly, if a system is conscious, it seems to have some kind of moral status, at least enters the arena of our moral calculations. If not, then uh, it seems that maybe it doesn't matter morally any more than a, a lectern or an iPhone does. Um, we have intuitions about the self persisting through time. We've got intuitions about qualities. Anyway, there's a lot of intuitions here. And sometimes as philosophers, we just think about these things in a first order way. Are these intuitions correct? If they're correct, what follows? And so on. But if you take the meta perspective, you can see these intuitions themselves as an object of analysis that we can study as objects and try to find their genesis and what explains them. So here we have an interdisciplinary research program, an empirical research program of trying to explain, to understand and explain these intuitions. In principle, it involves, on the one hand, experimental psychology and what people call experimental philosophy, which involves psychological studies of people's intuitive judgments. Both, I mean, psychologists have done this for years. Philosophers have started really focusing on these questions about intuitions in general for the last 20 years by doing, for example, psychological experiments to study and analyze people's judgments and to figure out what they co-vary with, what best explains them. In principle, there can be computational and neurobiological models of intuitions and reports about consciousness. And there's been a little bit of work in both of these directions so far. And indeed, there's philosophical analysis of what's going on. So this is this fairly neutral empirical program. Now, of course, it's, a, it's an empirical question how widely these intuitions are shared. You know, I have them pretty strongly. Um, in my experience, an awful lot of people share these intuitions about consciousness, but they're you know, by no means absolutely universal. There are some people who reject them, and there are some people who deny having them in the first place. It's a really interesting empirical question, how widely they're shared. And in principle, I think that's going to take a lot of everything from experimental philosophy and psychology to cross-cultural anthropology and linguistics to get at. One of, the mo one of the really interesting things to come out of this meta problem process so far for me is getting responses from uh, people who are engaged in that kind of work, experimental work, anthropological work, and so on, to make cases about precisely how widespread these intuitions are. These issues get very subtle about what you mean by uh, what it is to have the intuitions, what it is for them to be universal, and so on. Nonetheless, I think my sense, and I think it's brought out by all, I've even done a little bit of work here in experimental philosophy, collaborating with people on testing, Intuitions. My sense so far is the intuitions are pretty widely shared, at least as dispositions or intuitions. Sometimes they're overridden by theory, but at least as dispositions and intuitions. My sense is they're had probably by a majority of people, at least. But, you know, the data, we need to get better data on just how widespread they are. Part of the meta problem will be explaining, you know, why the intuitions are widely shared if they are, and if they're not universally shared, find out why they're not sh shared when they're not. Um, you know, there is quite a lot of empirical work on intuitions about the mind in the very field that's very broadly called theory of mind in psychology and cognitive science. It tends to focus in certain areas. Belief, you know, when do, for example, when do kids acquire the idea that beliefs about the world can be, uh, can be false? Uh, there are intuitions about the self. When is a system the same over time? When, can, when could a system, for example, survive its death? and so on. What work there is on consciousness in this perspective has tended until recently mostly to be about the distribution of consciousness. Can a robot be conscious? Can a group be conscious? So, um, you know, uh, Paul Bloom has written this beautiful book on 
the science of child development. He actually argues that people are, kids are intuitive dualists. They treat the mind intuitively as distinct from the body, um, which I think is very much of a, of a piece with this kind of meta-problem perspective, although his focus tends to be more on intuitions about the self than on consciousness per se. For example, about whether beings can survive the death of the physical body. It's not that much empirical work, at least until recently, directly on the core problem intuitions. There's a very nice piece by Sarah Gottlieb and Tanya Lombroso that came out just a couple of years now, a couple of years ago, called Can Science Explain the Human Mind? on people's judgments about when various mental phenomena are hard to explain, and they find, out, and they find that when things are introspectively accessible or have some kind of privileged access, then our intuitions about difficulty of science explaining them go up a lot. But I think there's room for a lot more here. So part of this is a call to arms for this um, neutral empirical research program of trying to explain the empirical basis of intuitions and judgments here. Um, topic neutral, neutral, neutrality part is really um, an epicycle here to make sure that these explanations don't mention consciousness. You might think the best explanation of why we say the things we do about consciousness is we're conscious. We accurately detect it and we report it. And that might be true. Um, nonetheless, even if that's true, it's also possible to give it looks like it ought to be possible to give, say, a computational or algorithmic explanation of our judgments here that doesn't mention consciousness, or maybe a neurobiological one that doesn't mention consciousness. So we're going to stipulate that the kind of explanations we're interested in are topic neutral in this way. That's basically required to turn the meta problem into an easy problem that doesn't require figuring out the basis of consciousness first. It's consistent with a causal role for consciousness. But a topic neutral explanation is going to specify the role of consciousness structurally. So, you know, we've basically got some kind of structural network, say, that produces, gets some inputs, produces these outputs. It may be that consciousness is playing a role inside this network, but we're going to cast the explanation in structural algorithmic term. Okay, but that, that detail is not going to matter too much in what follows. Okay, now I want to get to say just a little bit about potential solutions to the meta problem. Actually, I do not have a solution to the meta problem. If any of you do, please let me know. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to hear it. There are a lot of ideas bubbling around. And even since I started thinking about this a year or two ago, there have been a few articles coming out saying, here's a potential solution to the meta problem in terms of this mechanism and that. And I, don't, I think the meta problem ought to be solvable. So I think there ought to be a solution within sight, but I don't think we have it yet. Um, so there's a goal here in the, uh, in the middle distance. But here are some, uh, I want to at least go over some things which I think might be components of a solution to the meta problem. There have been ideas here and there, although there's no unified literature. Here are a few, but just go over a few promising ideas. One is the idea that there are, I think one central component of any solution any solution to the meta problem has to be the idea that the mind has models of itself. Just as our, you know, we've got an intuitive folk physics of the external world building models of the external world, the mind also builds models of itself. This is an idea that's played a really central role in Doug's work. We have internal self models modeling our own cognitive processes. And Michael Graziano more recently has picked up on this kind of idea and try to argue we've got models of our own processes of attention, he thinks these explain, might explain our sense there is a problem of consciousness. I find this very, very plausible. This has got to be part of a, of a solution. I always liked, um, back in Gödel Escher Bach, Doug used this uh, wonderful um, artwork print gallery from uh, MC Escher as a way of sort of illustrating this point, that somehow as an inevitable consequence of having models of our self, there's always going to be some kind of hole in our sense of ourselves, in our explanation. And that's kind of, the, I think of that as the hole where the problem of consciousness gets in somehow. This is a beautiful explanation of, you know, this guy is modeling a world that contains the guy. And somehow you can't fit all the pieces together beautifully. There's always going to be some hole at the center. Somehow the problem of consciousness gets in. I think there's got to be something right about that. 
still, I'm very interested, but still the question is how? Why is there this, uh, how does this give rise to the specific intuitions about consciousness that we have? You know, what is it about the models? And I don't think so far, you know, more needs to be said to, to explain that. Another idea, which I think has to be central here, is that we have special introspective concepts of our mental states. They're independent of physical concepts. People sometimes talk about phenomenal concepts here, or we can also do this in terms of symbols. So Doug talks a lot about the need for self symbols. Where does the self come from? Well, we have this summer, any cognitive system is gonna end up having a giant symbol representation for the self that stands for the self. And maybe many of our intuitions about the self can be explained in terms of the way that the self symbol works. I mean, Doug's, uh, I think Doug's focus in these questions has always very much been on the self and of the sense of self, which is related to consciousness, but not exactly uh, the same issue. But I think these ideas can be put into the key of consciousness by talking about the need for con a consciousness symbol in, uh, any rep in a representational system or an intelligent system. If there's reasons to think it might represent itself as being conscious in certain ways, as being consciousness, conscious of the world, there might be a consciousness concept or a consciousness symbol that somehow gives rise to our problem report. So maybe there's reasons to think the consciousness symbol will be interestingly independent of the symbols for the physical world, thereby explaining the sense of a gap. And I think that's got to be right as well, although, but still, much more remains to be explained. Why is it that we have this consciousness symbol, and why does it function in just the way that it does? There's also this idea, due to David Armstrong and others, of introspective opacity. Armstrong's idea is we don't see that consciousness is physical. Introspection doesn't reveal the physicality of consciousness. So instead we see it as non-physical. And his analogy is with this so-called headless woman effect from, uh, you know, from like 19th century circuses. We don't see the person's head, so we see her as having no head. So here's a, this rather gruesome exhibit from, uh, from circuses. To, there's a there's a woman with a, uh, just wearing a veil over the head. I guess from certain angles, if you look at this, it looks like she has no head. And uh, Armstrong's idea is, well, you don't see the head, therefore you see her as having no head. Um, I'm, I don't know, I think, I'm not sure I really get the uh, effect that strongly. <laughs> and, you, and you know, it takes very, very special circumstances to get that effect. You know, things, everything has to be lined up just so. So I don't think we're at all, I mean, I'm, I'm now, I'm not seeing a bunch of you as having heads, I certainly don't see you as lacking heads. So it takes very special circumstances to make that inference. I think those would need to be explained. Likewise, there are many things we don't see their physicality. I deal with my iPhone, there are computer processes in, in there, I don't see their physical basis. I don't suddenly infer my iPhone has some special non-physical essence. Um, so there are questions then, but um, there are also questions, I think in all, for all of these explanations about why we get this distinctive gap for consciousness, we don't get it nearly so strongly for mental states like belief. You know, I believe that uh, Bloomington's in Indiana and so on. Maybe my belief, it's not entirely obvious how to explain those in physical terms, but you don't get as strong as, you don't get that strong distinctive sense of gappiness you get with say the experience of red or the sensation of pain. So there's some differences to be explained there too. We want an explanation that doesn't generalize too strongly to predict an equal gap in all these cases. Um, going a little bit further, I think there's something to the idea that, you know, when it comes to colors, there's a sense that color experience somehow presents colors as primitive elements of the world, you know, redness and, uh, and greenness. They seem to be these simple, primitive properties. Now, they're not. They're complicated physical properties in the environment that affect us in certain ways. Nonetheless, phenomenology presents them as primitive. Why? Maybe that's useful. Um, in some work, I've called these Edenic qualities, where the idea is, back in the Garden of Eden, things really had those primitive properties. We fell from Eden, um, nothing has those properties, but still the Edenic qualities are a useful model of the non-Edenic world. That's just for colors in the external world so far, why we get primitive qualities there. But one thought is maybe we do something like that with the mind. We simplify the mind to ourselves, we present it as involving primitive qualities, and maybe even primitive relations that uh, makes the mind seem somehow primitive to us in the way that 
colors do. So maybe there's, say, a primitive, you don't just get, say, you don't just attribute primitive qualities of redness, say, to the world, but you attribute a primitive relation of awareness of those qualities. And you mod your model of the mind is just simpler when everything seems simple and primitive. So maybe that's a way to move things forward. And associated with that is the idea, I think this is very key to many intuitions about consciousness. Our internal models give us a sense of being acquainted both with these concrete qualities and with our awareness of them. The sense of acquaintance. I think it's very, to many people who are really bothered by the problem of consciousness, there's this sense that consciousness is right there, you're acquainted with its qualities in a way which is peculiarly direct. So if we can explain that sense, that will go a long way. Okay, so this is really just to get on the table maybe some elements. I don't even think of what's laid out so far as really potential explanation. It's just a way of getting clearer on what needs to be explained. But here's a possible summary, at least, of the kind of approach to the meta problem that I find at least uh, potentially, potentially helpful. Um, one thing I like about what I've written here is can, this has all been written neutrally to be both available both to an illusionist. An illusionist will regard this as an explanation of the illusion of consciousness. Why we think all those false things about consciousness because our mental models make us think so. A realist like me, someone who thinks consciousness is real, can read this as an account of what's going on with our real contact with consciousness. Um, and, but this has been phrased in a topic neutral way to, so both readings are available. So we have introspective models deploying introspective concepts of our internal states that are largely independent of our physical concepts. These concepts are introspectively opaque, not revealing any of the underlying mechanisms. Our perceptual models perceptually attribute primitive perceptual qualities to the world, and our introspective models attribute primitive mental relations to these qualities. These models produce the sense of acquaintance, both with those qualities and with our awareness of those qualities. And again, illusionists will see this as an explanation of the illusion, a realist will say, but if you're a realist, hear this the realist way. If you're an illusionist, hear this the illusionist way. Like I said, I think this is just a very intermediate step on the way to a solution. Much of this remains to itself to be explained. The more explanandum thing that needs to be explained than explanand, things that does the explaining. Still, I think we can put forward ideas of this form and then test them. In principle, in this meta problem research program, we can test potential explanations with psychological studies and computational models. This is a developing area, but uh, yeah, the one nice computational model I, learn, I know is a little simple software agent designed by uh, two AI researchers, Luke Mulhauser and Buck Schlageris, who took some things I'd written about the meta problem and Francois Camera, a French philosopher, had written and said, okay, we can make computation out of that. And they built a little, uh, little AI system that started with certain you know, axioms um, of its beliefs about the physical world and about consciousness. It didn't build in non-reductionism about consciousness, so they say, and then they put a little theorem prover to work with those axioms, and they got out some, some conclusions, like, ah, consciousness is not physical. Consciousness, there's my, there's my algorithm, and there's my consciousness, and those are distinct things. So it's their little computer program turned into an intuitive dualist. Now, I'm not sure this model proves too much just yet. It's a very, it's massively oversimplified in all kinds of ways, and it's not clear that it's doing anything like what we were doing. Still, there's a research program suggested of testing, refining these models until you've got something which is a good model of our processes. And then that will raise the question, is that really at the basis of our sense of the problem of consciousness? One question, by the way, is if a machine issues the same sorts of problem reports as us, in a really systematic way, caused by similar mechanisms, then is that machine itself conscious? I mean, a few people have suggested, um, Aaron Sloman has suggested this kind of thing as a Turing test, potential Turing test for machine consciousness. And Susan Schneider and Ed Turner have picked up on this more recently. Basically, the best way to find out whether a machine is conscious is, well, first of all, you ask it, you know, is it conscious? and so on. But secondly, you probe its concepts and you see, is it puzzled by consciousness? Does the machine say, you know, does it, you find the machine saying things like, well, I know in principle I'm just a bunch of silicon circuits, but from the inside I feel like so much more. 
<laughs> then, uh, you know, maybe you'll have uh, some reason to think the machine is conscious. Well, that's one perspective. On the other perspective, it's just the machine has just gone to all this trouble to have to fool humans into believing in all that consciousness nonsense just to get admitted to their moral circle. It's like the machine that had to take the, uh, the talk like a human course to pass the, uh, the Turing test. It went through its Turing test study guide. And, you know, why did, and the machine has to demean itself by reproducing all of our dumb philosophical intuitions. So I'll leave that question about impact on AI, artificial consciousness open. But I want to talk a little bit before I end about impact on theories of consciousness. Like there's a couple of different ways in which a solution, thinking about the meta problem, has impact on theories. First on scientific theories of consciousness, and then on philosophical theories of consciousness. So, I mean, I think that, as I mentioned, a solution to the meta problem and a solution to the hard problem will be very closely connected. Here's one way of articulating a connection. Whatever explains consciousness, say you've got a theory of consciousness, explains it, say in terms of processes in the brain or whatever, computational processes. Whatever explains consciousness should also partly explain our judgments about consciousness. Why? At least if these judgments are correct. If you're a realist who thinks our judgments about consciousness are correct, it would be very strange if the basis of consciousness played no role in generating our judgments about consciousness. It would be a weird coincidence, for example, that they ended up being correct. So if a theory of consciousness says that mechanism M is the basis of consciousness, then M should partly explain our judgments about consciousness. So, you know, we can apply this to different theories. One famous, one very well-known scientific theory of consciousness right now is Giulio Tononi's integrative information theory. Um, Tononi defines up a certain mathematical measure of integrated information that he calls phi. You basically apply it to network systems and it's a complicated network property. It's very hard to calculate, but calculate it in principle um, of phi. And he says, basically, the higher phi you have, the more consciousness you have. And eh, it's a very controversial theory. There's a lot to say about it. But it is a currently very popular approach, which has had a lot of influence in neuroscience and psychology, as well as uh, you know, philosophy and, uh, and AI. Um, to say that's your approach to consciousness. The integrated information is the basis of consciousness. Here's a challenge. How does integrated information really help explain problem reports? And there's a worry that integrated information seems kind of dissociated from the report processes. Not just that you can have, not just there's more goes into report processes. It's kind of hard to see how integrated information is pushing those report processes around. One issue is that you have simulations with the same tendency to report, but zero phi. It turns out on IIT, a, simu a computer simulation of a process won't have the same phi. Turns out you can also have high phi without the report tendency. So there's at least a potential challenge there, a kind of dissociation. I don't say this is anything like a knockdown argument against IIT, but I think it's a challenge for many theories to explain about uh, explaining how it is that these bases of consciousness have the effects that they need to have. Um, I think you can apply similar critiques to other theories, both scientific and philosophical, but I won't go into that here. The other kind of impact I'm interested in is impact on illusionism. Um, remember, I introduced the meta problem. In introducing the meta problem, I brought out the idea that somehow the meta problem, solving the meta problem might dissolve the hard problem. This is the program that Keith Frankish has been pushing. But this is the idea that a solution to the meta problem might lead to debunking our beliefs about consciousness. And here's the very rough idea. If we can explain why we think we're conscious independently of consciousness, then those beliefs aren't justified. That's meant to be like an instance of a model you find in many domains. If you can explain our belief in God independently of God, then maybe those beliefs aren't justified. If you can explain our beliefs in morality without postulating genuine moral facts, then maybe our belief in genuine moral facts aren't justified, and so on. So that kind of approach tends to lead to illusionism about consciousness. Because if our beliefs about consciousness are not justified, that is, my belief that I'm conscious isn't truly justified, and you might think, okay, why not just get rid of consciousness 
altogether, the same way somebody might get rid of God in that circumstance. That's what philosophers call a debunking argument. One way which I like to keep out this is kind of through the lens of coincidence. If our judgments about consciousness are explained algorithmically, consciousness is not, maybe it's something extra, then it just seems to turn out to be some kind of very weird coincidence that our judgments about consciousness should be correct, could be made true by this extra element somehow. And that can start to seem rather bizarre. Um, you know, one way, I think, so interesting to think about how realists should resist the debunking argument. I think the most promising approach is to make the case that consciousness somehow realizes and, realizes and underlies the processes that explain our problem intuitions and plays some key role there. Then the challenge is to make that work. Maybe a panpsychist, for example, can argue that consciousness is somehow underlying the process, or a dualist could say something too. One of the more interesting things to come out of the recent work on the meta problem for there's a symposium in the Journal of Consciousness Studies is a couple of realists actually developing specific models here to respond. They don't have time to go into that, but it kind of goes with this idea that maybe, yeah, there's a structural explanation of the reports, but consciousness is playing a role in getting it, uh, getting it all to go, if you like, and then in a way that makes consciousness essential to the best underlying explanation. But I, I want to close by talking about illusionism. Remember, illusionism says consciousness doesn't exist. We just think it does. Strong illusionism. A solution to the meta problem dissolves the hard problem. And um, here, the kind of illusionism I'm interested in is what people call strong illusionism. Phenomenal consciousness doesn't exist. There's also weak illusionism that says it exists, but we're wrong about some of its properties. But I'll just focus on the strong version. So here's a, one common view is that strong illusionism doesn't even make sense. Strong illusionism about consciousness is contradictory. Why? Because the moment you have an illusion, that's itself a conscious experience. The illusion of consciousness is itself conscious. And that's a tempting thing to say. I think the best reply for the illusionist is to say, well, no, consciousness doesn't exist. Illusions are not themselves conscious states. They're judgments. They're like representations or judgments that control our behavior. The illusion itself is a judgment, not a conscious experience. And somehow our brain has got these little self-models that make it make these judgments. I'm conscious, I'm conscious, I'm conscious. The conscious part is just attributed to ourselves as part of the illusion. It's not part of reality. But I do think there's a very, very flat-footed argument against illusionism, which is not the most subtle one, but it's, but it's um, um, I think I'll skip the parts on, uh, on weak illusionism. Here's a very, very flat-footed argument against uh, strong illusionism. Um, not at all subtle, but I think it's probably, uh, you know, it captures the sense of why many people find illusionism just frankly uh, unbelievable. It goes like this. People sometimes feel pain. Uh, if strong illusionism is true, no one feels pain. Therefore, strong illusionism is false. I mean, pain is just the conscious experience here of pain. I'm talking about the feeling of pain it seems absolutely undeniable. If the strong illusionist really says nobody is phenomenally conscious, then they have to deny there are any conscious experiences and deny there's a genuine feeling of pain. Now it says it sounds like, you know, I'm making the, I'm caricaturing the illusionist position to make it sound uh, sound ridiculous, but that's the kind of thing you have to say if you want to deny that there is conscious experience. You have to deny there is anything it's like, and at this moment, there's always a temptation to water down the illusionism, to make it say something less strong. Yeah, maybe there is a feeling of pain. It's just not quite what we thought. I think that's a mistake. I think it's you know, absolutely essential to making strong illusionism work that it says something totally crazy and counterintuitive. <laughs> um, because it's just saying that you know, we have these built-in models inside our head that make us believe with absolute strength that there is these, uh, these special properties of conscious. Consciousness, it makes something seem introspectively obvious that is not. So the best form and the most powerful form of illusionism will deny, has to deny something which is introspectively obvious and requires them to say something like this. But this does, of course, leave them open to this kind of argument, analogous to what philosophers... It's a bit like G.E. Moore's famous argument in philosophy. He proves external reality by, here is one hand, here is another. Therefore, there is an external world. We do the same thing for... Here is a pain, therefore a consciousness exists. Not a subtle argument, but it is a very hard one to uh, respond to. At the very least, at least to this kind of unbelievability 
it seems to many people unbelievable that no one feels pain and that no one is conscious. So therefore, strong illusionism seems unbelievable. Now, I think what the illusionist should now say is that's a virtue of my, uh, of my view. The illusionist in my view predicts that my view will be unbelievable. You know, you have these self, little self models that make you believe in this stuff, and it's just impossible for you to believe otherwise. And some of the more consistent illusionists have come out that way, but it turns out not to be, not to be like dialectically or for advertising, let's say for marketing purposes, it's got its, that view has its downside. So anyway, I think we're left. I am really a sympathizer in some ways with illusionism, although I find it unbelievable. Um, I think we're left with an interesting kind of standoff here. Here on one, two different kinds of absurdity, of two different views. Here's Strawson, Galen Strawson, well articulating one kind of absurdity, the apparent absurdity of illusionism. He said, there occurred in the 20th century the most remarkable episode in the whole history of ideas, the whole history of human thought. A number of thinkers denied the existence of something we know with certainty to exist, consciousness. So that's, yeah, that's the view that illusionism is unbelievable and absurd. On the other, on the other side, we've got the rationalist uh, thinker Eliezer Budkowski writing about consciousness and the mind-body problem, and he was actually responding to some stuff of mine, making the case that dualism is absurd, in particular epiphenomenalism, the view where consciousness doesn't play a causal role. He says, the zombie argument, this one of my arguments, may be a candidate for the most deranged idea in all of philosophy. The causally closed cognitive system of Chalmers' internal narrative is malfunctioning in a way that not by necessity, but just in our universe, miraculously happens to be correct. Okay, there's a lot to be said about that, but that's, I think, a wonderful articulation of this, what I was calling the debunking argument, the view that realism about consciousness threatens to make our judgments true by coincidence. Now, there's middle ground here. I mean, these are two very extreme views. There's middle ground, but it tends to slide back to the same problems. I think other forms of illusionism, weaker forms, don't help with the hard problem. You can make the case that other forms of realism, not just epiphenomenalism, are still subject to this kind of miraculous correctness critique I think somehow here we have to get beyond one or both of these forms of absurdity. Illusionists need to so explain how having a mind can somehow be like this, even if it's not exactly the way that it seems. It's got to make the case that it's not somehow phenomenologically bl completely blind uh, to have a mind. Realists need to explain how meta-problem processes can be essentially grounded in consciousness even if it's possible for them to occur without consciousness. And a couple of people have been thinking recently in that direction. So anyway, I'm inclined to think that if we can arrive at a solution to the meta problem on one side or the other that meets these ambitions, it's possible, not certain, but possible, that could end up solving the hard problem of consciousness. In the meantime, even short of a solution to the hard problem, the meta problem is a potentially tractable research project for everyone, and one I'd like to recommend to you. So thanks. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start with uh, questions, and I see this side of the room is very ambitious, but this side is not, oh good, we got someone over here. So since that's a short line, and that is a, is that a line over there? That's, wait a minute. Okay, so we'll start on this side. Hey, Dave. Uh, great talk. Um, just, just a question about something you said near the end. So you were really kind of plumping for uh, the realist and the illusionist to go extreme. Yeah. I was a little bit skeptical about that because I'm thinking um, in both cases, the less, lesser extreme variety of kind of anti-reduction or, or illusionism uh, are going to be a little more uh, easy to believe because the, the, the weaker illusionist that says, Look, your, your talk of consciousness answers to something. It's just there, we can give some kind of explanation why you're tempted to say certain things about it that just aren't true. That, I don't know. That's, that's a much easier thing to say than just say all of our talk is we're, we're pointing at nothing um, on the one hand. And then I take it the weaker variety of, of realism uh, is something that says, no, consciousness is actually going to play an integral role in that. Uh, and it seems like uh, if you're saying, I I'm not sure why we should go towards the extreme, because then we're saying, no, it's just kind of contingently associated with these processes, but it's not 
involved, it does look like an accident. So why, why wouldn't I, if I'm a realist, bet on some kind of interactionist kind of view? And why, if I'm an illusionist, wouldn't I be happy if I could just give a view that kind of chastens what, what I need to give an explanation? Yeah, good. Um, maybe I'll turn this thing. I realize I didn't have the one the whole time. You guys can hear me fine like this with these mics. Um, and how was this one? No, how was this one? Um, yeah, weak illusionism, my view is it doesn't really remove the hard problem. I mean, many weak illusionists try and say things like, yeah, we get fooled into thinking, you know, Dennett says, ah, consciousness is intrinsic or it's non-intentional. And then people say, ah, um, but still consciousness exists. I think the trouble with weak illusionism is that you don't need those properties to generate the hard problem. I think all you really need to generate the hard problem is this what it's like idea. You don't, it doesn't turn on there being further properties like in assuming consciousness has to be intrinsic, assuming it has to be non-physical, and so on. Even without those things, I think you can get the whole explanatory gap going. So, you know, we'd have to play this out in given cases. All you really, the only property you need is like phenomenality, what it's, what it's like. And denying that, I think, really is tantamount to rejecting phenomenal consciousness. So that's why I think weak illusionism doesn't really help close the gap. As for interactionism, I think interactionism is, a, uh, is an interesting uh, option here. But I don't think it, interactionism is the view consciousness is non-physical, but interacts with the physical, plays a causal role in generating brain processes and behavior. I mean, even if you're an interactionist, there's still the thought that, you know, the, maybe that that yellow dot is consciousness playing a non-physical role, and the blue dots are all physical stuff it's affecting. There still will be a structural, potentially a structural, topic neutral explanation of our behavior, maybe even an algorithmic explanation, depending on your views about how the non-physical consciousness plays its role. Just say it's an algorithmic explanation, then I think you know at least some element of the debunking worry still arises for the interactionist. There's this algorithmic explanation of consciousness, doesn't mention consciousness. Now, as a matter of fact, consciousness is playing some role in making the algorithm happen at one of the nodes. We could have had that algorithm, possibly without consciousness. I feel like there's still an element of the coincidence debunking worry there, unless you can make the case that consciousness is playing a causal role that could only and be best played by consciousness. The best proposal along this line by an interactionist is a recent paper by Brad Saad, I don't know if you know him replying um, to my paper on the meta problem where he argues for a certain kind of special psychophysical law of interaction that it's kind of a, it's a teleological law it says consciousness, roughly consciousness causes what it justifies. And this gives a kind of a special explanatory role to consciousness. Anyway, I think there are interesting challenges there, at least. I'm not saying that, I, that, it's, uh, not, that they can't be overcome, but I think those are the kinds of challenges that an interactionist would need to meet. Hi, thank you. Um, I really liked your argument against illusionism. I think it was the most compelling I've heard so far, actually, right? That, you know, even if, even if we think intellectually this makes sense on some level, it's just so counterintuitive, I can never have more warrant for believing that, rather than simply, you know, being a Mysterian or something, oh, consciousness must be physical somehow, but we just won't be able to figure out exactly how. So I really like that. That said, I wanted to ask you to respond to what I consider maybe the strongest argument uh, for illusionism. So, and, and I think this argument originates with my friend Benedict Vallée, actually. So she, she's talking about philosophical zombies. They're supposed to be molecule for molecule identical to us, and therefore, um, not just behave exactly as one of us behaves, but have the same mental life except stripped of its phenomenology, right? So form the same, you know, judgments understood in functional terms. So therefore, a philosophical zombie will have the intuition that Mary would learn something the first time she saw something red, um, would have the intuition that there's an explanatory gap problem, and would find illusionism absurd in the same way that any of us find it absurd. So. Therefore, I mean, it could be that any of us actually is a philosophical zombie, right? We would, you know, be thinking and, and saying all the same things, um, even if we weren't. So how do you respond to that argument for illusionism? Yeah, I sort of think of that as, yeah, that's definitely one way of articulating the debunking worries in terms of, yeah, a zombie would say the same things. 
just with the physical processes. So the physical processes explain why we say these things, and therefore those things aren't justified. I mean, I think if this was all done just from the third person point of view, you know, you saw a bunch of other people who were talking about this thing called consciousness. You saw the algorithms in their head that make them say this and all the self-models. I think absolutely that would seem like the, uh, the most natural response, I guess. I mean, I guess it, in a way, I guess yeah. in a way the, I mean, the, uh, the response, on the other hand, is going to be the thing you called the strong argument for illusionism, which is does that really accommodate the first person data? It might explain why it is that we respond and say certain things, but my data are not just that I respond and say certain things. My, my data, I think, include that I am conscious. Now there's this weird dialogue. I have a little dialogue between a realist and an illusionist in the written version of this. I say, these are my data. The illusionist says, you just think those are your data. There are, there are right. no data really, and this explains why you think those are your data. I'm saying, no, no, you don't, you don't just need to explain why I think these are data. You've got to explain the data. And um, so there is this complicated back and forth. And I, when I was writing this dialogue, I mean, I kind of feel, I felt some sympathies for the, uh, the illusionist side because it's much more interesting. Yeah, because uh, it is supposed cool. to capture something of the first person. I mean, the zombie wouldn't just say, I'm conscious. The zombie would powerfully believe that the zombie was conscious. Powerfully believe in the sense of belief, which means, you know, regulate its the behavior functional. in a certain way. I don't know that it's, you know, certainly not powerfully believe in the sense which brings in our intuitions about conscious, uh, conscious belief. So, you know, believe in a deflationary sense. And again, for explaining somebody else, I find that very convincing. Does it actually explain my situation. I mean, I can certainly get into the intellectual frame of mind yeah. where it does, um, but there's still fundamentally, and I like this move of saying that, yeah, we should expect, my, we should expect this view to be unbelievable, so maybe this is just an articulation of what it predicts, right, right, which is yeah. I don't believe it. Yeah. I can't okay. believe it. <laughs> All right, thank yeah. you. I'm gonna ask a question if you think that uh, the double slit experiment, does that rule out anything uh, of the possibilities for consciousness or narrow anything down? Yeah, for a long time, I was very, very skeptical about, you know, trying to explain consciousness in terms of quantum mechanics or vice versa, although I'm very interested in the interpretation of quantum mechanics. But gradually over the years, I found myself getting kind of sucked into this, uh, this area. Just say you think. You know, part of my, my whole approach to the problem of consciousness is to th try and think especially recently, has been trying to think constructively about the different places you might try and push forward on this problem, whether on the illusionist side or the, the realist side or the panpsychist side, but here on the dualist side. Just say you're a dualist and you think consciousness is non-physical but affects the physical world, an interactionist dualist, then the place to look. Many people say that's inconsistent with physics. There are no big causal gaps in physics for consciousness to fill, but there is this one place in physics that seems to be crying out for a potential role for consciousness, and that's the so-called collapse of the quantum wave function that, at least in standard traditional quantum mechanics, happens on certain occasions of measurement. What's measurement? No one knows. That's the quantum mechanical measurement problem, but at least seems to have some tie, prima facie, to human observation hypothesis. Um, it's precisely consciousness that brings about acts of wave function collapse. That's an old idea. It goes back to Eugene Wigner and others. Never really made rigorous so lately I've been kind of playing with this with a former student, um, Kelvin McQueen, who now teaches at Chapman University in California. We've been trying to see if we can make that idea rigorous through the physics, trying to build up a model where consciousness does actually could play a role. I mean, we had an idea, then it didn't, turned out the dynamics got very complicated. It comes up against the quantum Zeno effect, which causes problems for our rough idea was originally consciousness or its neural correlates never enter into quantum superpositions. So resist, uh, resist superpositions won't produce the interference effects and so on. But that runs up against the quantum Zeno effect. It turns out consciousness never enters superposition. Consciousness can never change. Bad effect, bad consequence. Consciousness never starts in the early universe. So now we're playing around with this to see if we can come up with another version of it. The net effect has, made, has been to make me actually a little bit more skeptical about the connection but we're still trying to see where we can, uh, where we can push it to go. I, th I think in particular, yeah, if you're an interactionist dualist who thinks consciousness plays a role in the physical world, this is one of the places you should be looking. Hi, uh, Dr. Chalmers, thank you so much for coming here to speak. I really appreciate it. Um, I, with that being said, I was a little 
critical of um, the framing of consciousness from the meta perspective. Um, you start off by talking about these two camps of having consciousness that is re irreducible and consciousness that is reducible, and you frame the meta problem as something that exists outside of these two camps. Um, in particular, I was kind of curious about um, topic neutrally explaining the these problem intuitions or why it's impossible um, without using the term consciousness itself isn't that fundamentally reducing consciousness. So to suggest that you can have an explanation of the problem of consciousness through the meta problem, aren't you implicitly either um, undermining it as solely an effect of a deeply underlying, of a deeper underlying force or overmining it as something that is, there's nothing underneath consciousness or you know it's all socially constructed? Hmm, I see. So the idea is that if we solve the meta problem, we'll either deflate consciousness on the one hand, that's undermining. What was the overmining side? Um, where I guess on the other hand, you see that there is nothing, un like there is nothing underneath the ego or what is in the mind, and it all ends up being socially constructed. I see. Socially constructed is, uh, is interesting. Why will it end up being, I see, the idea is if we solve one p possible solution to the meta problem, I think you're right, one possible solution is to say it's actually sociological. We just all have this belief about consciousness because, I don't know, Descartes was so influential and we're all stuck with Descartes' ridiculous legacy now or uh, maybe uh, somebody came along, you know, Nagel or who knows, Huxley 150 years ago and convinced us there's a problem of consciousness or maybe there's just a mistake that a bunch of philosophers are making. And I guess, you know, there, there are views where it's socially constructed and one or two people have tried, tried to take this line in response. I'm... And I think that's worth, uh, that's worth exploring. My own view is the problem of consciousness runs much deeper than that. And it does look like you can find these intuitions in very different cultures um, and so on. So I think, yeah, there's the potential of one, so one route to the, through the meta problem will lead to social construction. One route will lead, of reaction to the meta problem will lead to illusionism and therefore undermining consciousness. But I do think there are, that is having a solution to the meta problem is gonna be consistent with straightforward realism about consciousness, where it exists, where it's not deflated, and it's not, it's not undermined, but somehow the meta problem tells us something about how it, you know, for example, um, just say you gave, for example, Tim was talking about interactionist problems. Conscious, if it turns out consciousness plays a role that only consciousness can play, then uh, we'd have a picture of how it is that uh, consciousness can, can genuinely exist and play a certain play a certain role. So I guess that's the narrow path that I would like to navigate, the path between what you were calling undermining and overmining. But I agree that I have not yet made the case that that can be done. Thank you. Maybe that's my challenge. Hi. Um, so I'm still a bit puzzled about what the bearing on the meta problem is, is supposed to be on the problem. And the way I was trying to get my head around it was to use an analogy to a philosophical problem I think about a little bit more, which is about the problem of whether, say, numbers exist, right? And to think about whether the meta problem of people asking why do people think that numbers do exist, why do some people think that numbers don't exist, have a bearing on the problem whether they do exist. And it seems to me there's a, that they don't seem very much connected, right? So for example, if I think numbers exist, which I do, if somebody says they don't think they exist, I could sort of explain to them why they say that because they have a restricted existence concept or then I walk them through the fact that if they believe that two plus three equals five, that commits them to the existence of something which added to three equals five, right? And all these seem to be very theoretical things that don't seem quite connected to the question of bearing on the, uh, the how we're gonna figure out the problem of whether numbers exist. So as this is just a broad, just, you know, ask for sort of clarification. You see analogies or disanalogies between this and other sort of connections between problems and metaproblems in other areas of philosophy, and how might they be different from, say, you know, the problem I'm bringing up about numbers exist. So just to sort of uh, throw that out for there for you yeah. to sort of think about that. It's a, it's a great question. I think there are a lot of analogies and a lot of disanalogies <laughs> with other domains. I think philosophers have explored this the most, I think, in, in the case, I mentioned the cases of morality and God. I think in the recent literature there's been a lot on morality and actually quite a lot on numbers. Um, people trying to, there's this whole Banasar problem of explaining why we have the, the mathematical beliefs we do if numbers are abstract objects that don't play a role in that. And people have tried to make debunking style arguments against, say, Platonism about mathematical objects that says numbers are non-physical objects, but then say, well, our mathematical beliefs are not sensitive for those things. So wouldn't it be a weird coincidence if there were these non-physical objects that make our beliefs true? So in some ways, 
there are some, uh, some analogies there. I think the case of consciousness has got a, there's a broad structural analogy there that's very clear. A couple of differences between the cases. One that makes the problem even more robust than the consciousness case is someone like me thinks that, you know, zombies are, you know, zombies, physical person. Most people who believe in mathematics and mathematical objects think mathematical truths are necessary and if mathematical objects exist, they exist necessarily. Maybe you can't even conceive of them not existing. So you don't quite get a zombie problem. There'll be a mathematical universe with brains like ours, but no numbers, at least if you think numbers exist necessarily. But for consciousness, there's a danger. There'll be yeah, zombie worlds of no consciousness. That makes consciousness more open to a debunking argument. At the same time, there's also the strong sense that with consciousness, there's this direct knowledge of, direct unshakable knowledge of consciousness. It simply can't be denied. That's the sense of acquaintance. And maybe we don't have such a strong sense for, uh, for, uh, for numbers. So that's a sense in which debunking arguments for consciousness may have a higher bar to meet. So I've had a little, Justin Clark Doan, who works on debunking arguments in morality and mathematics, wrote a response to my meta problem piece. And now we've been ha having a bit of a back and forth about the issues. But I, I'm at least inclined to think there are, I mean, certainly the structural analogies are, are strong. Uh, Hartree Field has made versions of this debunking argument in a way that's really quite a lot like this coincidence style argument. I don't think there's a uniform solution to you know, debunking arguments always work or they fail. I think they can be resisted, but resisting them requires certain, uh, certain conditions. So yeah, to say more than that, probably have to go into fine details about the mathematical case. Hi, um, so I just had a question about, so if we all recognize that like consciousness is, well, not everyone, obviously illusionists and others excluded, but if we recognize that each human is like inserted with consciousness or panpsychists, they recognize like everything has a conscious, but, ha but we all recognize in a sense that it's non-physical. So, and for example, like um, we couldn't really explain like our bodily processes unless we could see them. And now we recognize that they are like, like seeing is believing in a sense. So, and um, with neuroscience, how it progressed is kind of with the progression of technology. So do you think our understanding of this non-physical consciousness could be subverted to that, to where it becomes like consciousness becomes like this almost tangible or like seeable or thing? Uh, and then that suddenly like reforms, like it becomes from non-physical to a physical thing through like possibly technology or some other source. I guess. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, I guess I do think in the, uh, in the first person case, consciousness is tangible and yeah. observable in its way. In my own case, I know my consciousness directly. But when it comes to anybody else. Yeah, you can experience not. it. Yeah, so we have this problem of other minds and I believe you're a conscious, but I can't measure it directly. But just say we came to have a theory of consciousness, understanding the relationship between consciousness and physical processes, then maybe in principle that could be used to develop a kind of technology. Say, um, you know, we've got a brain scanner that can, you know, measure the states of people's brains, and then we can apply our theory of consciousness to that. Then maybe, you know, in principle, that might give you, a, you know, be able to get some kind of readout of people's consciousness. Okay, there's all kinds of like horrific, potentially horrific political consequences. I once gave a talk at the at the CIA, the I don't know why they, I don't know why they, they invited me, but uh, uh -huh. I gave a talk about consciousness to the CIA, but, you know, some of the stuff, and they were you know, boring, boring. Then, but I mentioned the idea of this could be used for a consciousness meter, and then they were like, uh, <laughs> oh, okay, there's, so there's something we can use. You know, it would save a lot of trouble, waterboarding. Um, but uh, yeah, but, but you, can I, you can at least imagine, if we had a theory of consciousness, it could, at least in principle, be used in this way. And one could, in principle, forgetting the ethical worries, get some kind of readout of what's in people's consciousness. And that might make other people's consciousness somehow seem more tangible to us. Would it automatically make consciousness physical? I don't think it would necessarily do that, but it might somehow make it at least seem more within the remit of our understanding. And likewise, knowing you know, the things in our own brain that connect to our understanding those correlations well enough so we can know that just if we want to, you know, just say understanding the neural basis of depression well enough that you could manipulate the brain and, you know, no longer be, uh, no longer be depressed. Some people right now do that with, with drugs. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> imperfect. You can imagine somehow having a much more exquisite sensitivity to and control of one's own consciousness. I would argue that still wouldn't entail reducing consciousness to something physical. What it would do is 
really bring it strongly within the purview of science and indeed, as you say, of technology. And that might make it, you know, that might actually lead to something tangible and that we could use in our lives. Okay, well, I'm a neuroscientist, and so maybe some people in this room might think I'm a philosophical zombie. But uh, I'm going to ask a question anyway. And uh, it, it, it's about uh, trying to uh, really try and have a more global explanation for the idea of consciousness. And it seems to me that we as human primates are stuck in our little verbal gymnastics mode. Um, but what about animals? And what about animal cognition, animal consciousness? And how do you get your head around that? And how do you test for that? And how do you explore whether you might in fact have consciousness? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a great question. We had a, um, a conference on animal consciousness at NYU that I helped to organize maybe uh, two years ago now. And yeah, the stuff here is very much focused on the human case because after all these verbal reports and meta-problem intuitions, they seem very much in the domain of complex cognizers like humans. But in other contexts, I've thought a lot about consciousness in animals. My own inclination is to think that, I mean, again, just as with other people, um, we have no direct measure of consciousness in animals. We have indirect um, measures. I'm inclined to think that, at the very least, most arguments that you know, consciousness is restricted to the human case can be rebutted pretty straightforwardly. So people say, maybe consciousness requires language. Well, we know there, there are people that kind of lose capacities for language, and it looks like there's um, pretty strong reason to believe they're, they're conscious, and um, reasons to, there's not much reason to believe consciousness requires language. I, I mean, the trend, I would say, over the last 30 odd years I've been in this field is to be to ascribe consciousness much more broadly among non-human animals. I mean, maybe 30 years ago, there was still some debate about whether even primates are, are, are conscious, and people would then say, once it gets down to, I don't know, to birds, um, who's to say? Whereas these days, there's a much stronger sense among most researchers in the field that, yeah, there was even a, something called the Cambridge Declaration for Consciousness, saying, yeah, probably all mammals are conscious, and I can't remember, birds, and there was some statement about, I can't remember exactly what it said about birds and fish, but it was inclined to be optimistic about those two. There's still a debate, there's an ongoing, at our conference there was some debate over fish, whether fish can really genuinely consciously feel pain. The fisheries are very heavily invested in the idea they don't, so there are, <laughs> there are philosophers and cognitive scientists arguing, um, arguing that. But it seems like the trend is in the other direction. Fish certainly seem to have no susception that, that goes along with pain experience in us. And now actually the, the biggest argument among philosophers is over insects. Our insects are uh, Conscious. The trend has been towards a more liberal view here. It's an interesting question just why that is. Part is it a, uh, partly it's maybe partly discovering that some of these creatures are more sophisticated than we, than we thought. I don't think that's all of it though. It may be partly that people have changed what they mean. In the old days when people said consciousness, they meant self-consciousness and reflective consciousness. Now the focus is very much moved to phenomenal consciousness. I think it's at least in part though a view that phenomenal consciousness is itself is now taken to be more, the trend has been to see it as widespread, more widespread, more primitive, and not requiring these complicated mechanisms. So having meta-problem processes, to have that, you've got to, you know, maybe only humans have those, but consciousness itself is something much more, uh, much more basic. So my own view is that consciousness is likely to be very, uh, very, very widespread. And, uh, you know, I've, I've really speculated about the possibility of panpsychism, which means it's everywhere, but even short of panpsychism, I think it probably goes a long way. And I think these are important questions to figure out because, you know, my own view is, that, again, consciousness and moral status are very closely connected. Consciousness brings you into the, uh, into the ring of, uh, of moral status. And if a creature is conscious, then we've got to at least somehow factor it in to our, uh, to our calculations. Of course, the more widespread you make consciousness, if everything is conscious, then suddenly it can't just be consciousness. It's got to be the kind of consciousness that matters, you know, just suffering, matter more, just thinking, matter more. So those are all hard questions. But there are a lot of, I could point you to a lot of interesting work on consciousness. There's actually a, there's a journal now called Animal Sentience, wholly devoted to the issue of consciousness in animals with arguments back and forth. There's a, one, a really great book by the philosopher Peter Godfrey Smith called, uh, it's just called Other Minds actually, and it's all about the octopus. And it's about the case for consciousness in the octopus. So that, that'd be a great place to start. And it also extends to pre-verbal human primates.
Oh, absolutely, actually. This is the, uh, this is the specialty of my, of, of my own partner, Claudia Passos, who, uh, who does research on, uh, on, animal co on, sorry, on infant consciousness, infant self-consciousness, infant sense of agency, and she's been doing a lot of great work in, uh, in, uh, in this area. And I've, I pretty strongly believe that, uh, that uh, even newborn infants are, have conscious experience. Um, thank you for your speech. All right, so the psychological phenomenon of perceptual blindness, an illusion may be, be an example of this, um, perhaps more notably sensory blindness. My question is, is there something analogous to this with consciousness, call it self-blindness, where one would be, where one would have an experience, be in an experience without being made aware that one is in fact having said experience. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's, there are at least some tantalizing possible cases of this. Here's one, just say, there's what we are attending to at a given time and we're conscious, and then there's like what's outside our attention. And it kind of feels, at least phenomenologically, like, yeah, there's what I'm attending to and there's what's outside. There's, my con there's things which I'm conscious of. There's some kind of sensory feeling, but it's outside my attention. But how do I come to know about that? Well, the most obvious way I come to know about it is by attending to it. Okay, now I actually attend to the margins. I, I'm looking at you, but I'm attending to the margins of my visual field. And yeah, there seems to be some consciousness there. But that's not the right thing, right? Because that's now, now I'm attending to it. Was I conscious of it before I attended to it? you get this kind of refrigerator light effect. It's like, well, once I attend, it's there. So <laughs> once I open the door, the light's on. So the light was always on. Some people argue that we're not conscious. We don't have consciousness there. But I'm kind of, you know, we, there's a good chance we have consciousness there. But that may be a kind of consciousness that's implicit. Consciousness outside attention is at least a kind of consciousness that it's impossible by definition to attend to. Once you attend to it, it's consciousness inside attention. Could you have some kind of basic background awareness more basic than attention? Well, maybe, and maybe it kind of feels like that, but it's at least not a cognitively articulated kind of attention. So that's one kind of self-blindness. There are other kinds I think you can get in various pathologies where people have all kinds of, you know, there are pathologies of awareness of your, uh, of your body and there's pathologies of awareness of your mind. There's, you know, Anton syndrome, which is blindness denial. People, you know, think that they can see when they, uh, when they can't. And that seems to involve a pretty serious failure of our introspective Mechanism. So I, I'm a, I guess I'm inclined to, at the very least, in you know, in bath pathological cases and, and disease, there's pretty good reason to think just as our perceptual models can go wrong, our introspective models can go uh, can go badly wrong, and um, maybe even in some of these normal cases. Of course, somebody like Dan Dennett might say, no, in fact, that's actually what's happened to us all the time. <laughs> we think we're having all these wonderful states of, of consciousness. None of them are real. You're actually we're massively self-blind. Uh, Self-blind as it is, that's the illusionist view. But I guess you were saying short of, um, short of illusionism. I think, yeah, even short of illusionism, pretty well everyone should admit that we at least sometimes make mistakes about consciousness. The path between consciousness and judgment, there are things that can go wrong. I mean, there's that case of attention. We're at least initially, many people are at least initially inclined to think we experience the whole world like a picture, you know, with equal levels of detail at every point. I don't know to what extent. Maybe we don't feel exactly like that, but we know that can't quite happen because the amount of detail in the, uh, in the retina doesn't support, doesn't support that. But maybe that, you know, it's easy to see why one would be led to, to be wrong, at least in some ways, about our conscious experience. And once you've gone that far, then it's at least tempting to go further and see if one can push it all the way to uh, illusionism. But you know, maybe there are also some interesting stopping points in between. Thank you. Let's find David Sarnish. 